Bienvenue à la 66. Welcome to the 66th meeting of the Standing Committee on Abor and Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. We recognize that our meeting today is taking place on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nations. Furthermore, our meeting today is being conducted in a hybrid format in, a format in accordance with the House order adopted on Thursday, June 23, 2022, and members will be present in person or with a Zoom application. The proceedings will be posted on the House website. For your information, the webcast will always show the individual speaking rather than the entire committee. I'd like to outline a few rules to follow. You may speak in the official language of your choice. Interpretation services are available for this meeting in French, English, or a Nuktitut. You have the choice at the bottom of your screen or on the console of either floor for no interpretation, English or French. Please select your languages now. If interpretation is lost at any time, please inform me immediately and we will ensure interpretation is properly restored before resuming the proceedings. For members participating in person, proceed as you usually would when the whole committee is meeting in person in a committee room. Before speaking, please wait until I recognize you by name. If you are on the video conference, please click on the microphone icon to unmute yourself. Those in the room, your mic will be controlled as normal by the proceedings and verifications officer. S'il vous plaît, adressez vos interventions. Please address your comments to the chair. Speak slowly and clearly. When you are not speaking, your mic should be on mute. With regard to a speaking list, the committee clerk and I will do the best we can to maintain consolidated order of speaking for all members, whether they are participating virtually or in person. Pursuant to Standing Order 1082 and the motion adopted by the committee on November 21st, 2022, we are continuing the study of the Office of the Parliamentary Budget Officer's report on the research and comparative analysis on the estimates of the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs and the Department of Indigenous Services. Joining us today to discuss this report is the Honorable Mark Miller, Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations, and the Honorable Patty Haidu, Minister for Indig Indigenous Services and their respective officials. From the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, we have Daniel Kwan Watson, Deputy Minister. Darlene Best, Chief Finances and Results and Delivery Officer from the Department of Indigenous Services. We have Valerie Gideon, Associate Deputy Minister. Philip Thompson, Chief Finances, Results and Delivery Officer. And Eric Guimond, Chief Data Officer. We will begin with five minutes of introductory comments, although I know, um, Minister Hydro, you have about eight minutes prepared and I would like to hear the full eight minutes, so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll proceed with that. We will begin with Minister Miller for five minutes. Hello, bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. Before getting started, I would like to recognize that we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I thank you for the committee and the chair for inviting me to present today. The government has committed to supporting the rights of Indigenous peoples to self-government and to invest in this right and uh, right historic wrongs their significant in, in a culturally appropriate way and we need a, a strong partnership the report being considered today references large increases in spending by CERNAC this is the result of historic investments of our government that is made and made to advance reconciliation support self-determination address historical wrongs and create meaningful partnerships to renew relationships with indigenous peoples it is important to be ambitious and when we fall short, to recognize that. Most of you on this committee are already familiar with some of the major initiatives and investments the government has made on this file. For example, in March, the federal court approved the Godfrey's Band Class Settlement Agreement. Through this settlement, Canada will transfer $2.9 billion into Indigenous-led trust to support the revival of, and protection of Indigenous languages and cultures, the protection and promotion and heritage, uh, and wellness for Indigenous communities and their members. This is the first time Canada is compensating bands for the loss of language and culture as a result of the residential school system. Unfortunately, if we were to rely solely on the PBO report on this, this groundbreaking settlement, this would be construed as and characterized as a resistance to change, despite it being a groundbreaking agreement. And this is something perhaps the deputy ministers can speak about in some of the challenges we had in reacting to this report between uh, the comparison that the PBO has made between planned and actual expenditures, given the fact that uh, these departments, for the most part, uh, do get funded by supplemental estimates. And we think this is something that could have benefited the committee if it had been properly reflected in the PBO report. With regards to ending the national crisis on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and gender diverse people, the government of Canada has taken various steps to respond to the National Action Plan and implement the federal pathway. Budget 2023 notably will invest an additional $125 million over six years 
with 20 million to address the national inquiries calls for justice. This builds on the $2.2 billion provided in Budget 2021 and includes new funding for improved oversight and accountability. I know this committee, for example, has started a land back study. Canada's relationship with Indigenous people started with land and its relationship is broken because of land. The tip of the iceberg of this debate, uh, additions to reserves, is an important aspect of some of the indicators that are being studied in this PBO report. It's important to note that since 2015, more than 440 ATRs have been completed with over 265,000 acres of land to reserve being added. This past fiscal year alone, 39 ATRs were completed and many more remain in the queue. Yet we have fallen short on this indicator. And this is an important thing for the community to consider because if you'd read the report, you wouldn't have seen that. And it's important to recognize that when you go over these reports that this commission is, this committee has, uh, has asked the PBO to produce. And when we talk about qualitative indicators, we need to start talking about the quality of those actual indicators. And unfortunately, again, um, while this is a failing, it is something that had it been explained in the report would have been a benefit to you in questioning us today. Um, Importantly, um, from a historical perspective, on another note, from 1973 to March 31, 2023, a total of 660 specific claims have been resolved for close to $12.5 billion in compensation. Over the past five years alone, we've settled an average of 39 claims per year, which is up from an average of 15 claims per year over the past five previous years, rather. And in fiscal 2022-2023, we had a record year with 56 claims resolved for $3.5 billion in compensation. Again, this is num another aspect of the quality of the report, unfortunately, of the qualitative indicators that is missing uh, in its detail in the report, and that would be important to consider because these record settlements are changing lives in communities. And it's important to be ambitious, not only when setting the indicators, but when in implementing them. Um, I will return uh, and, and conclude on this point, and I think it is some responsibility that is mine when it comes to the two years that covered the COVID pandemic. Um, let's be honest, the, a number of these indicators had to get paused during this period while we focused on something that is very basic to Indigenous peoples, their lives and their safety. There's no indicator in this that measures the success of the COVID response of this government. Yet if you compare, and sadly, unfortunately, you do have to compare sometime mortality rates in Indigenous communities in Canada versus those in the US, this may be the first world pandemic where Indigenous communities are at or have even surpassed um, non-Indigenous communities and how they responded thanks to the work that, that they did. That's measured nowhere here in this report. But it is something that is important to realize because again, we are a country and things do arise that uh, periodic indicators will not encapsulate. So I'm not at this committee uh, leveling uh, any undue criticism on this because I think as we review these indicators, it's important to look at them and then question our department where we are not meeting those indicators, look at the quality of those indicators and continue to be ambitious as a country and as a government about meeting them. Um, so what I put to you today is uh, a humble suggestion perhaps for uh, further reports that do scrutinize these departments to focus on the quality of those indicators to get more flesh in order for this committee to better hold uh, people like me sitting here to account. I do thank you for the ability to speak, Chair, for five minutes and ready for questions or the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Miller. I'll now move to Minister Haidu for eight minutes. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair Kwekwe, Luka Tansi. Hello, bonjour. And uh, I too, obviously, am with you here on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Je tiens à remercier. I would like to thank the Parliamentary Budget Officer for his report. And I am pleased with the opportunity to help this committee focus on a number of essential points concerning the work carried out in partnership with the with First Nations, Métis and Inuit to achieve transformative change. Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada was driven by the Liberal government's efforts to 
begin the important work of rebuilding trust with Indigenous partners by demonstrating that the extensive consultations undertaken by the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples over two decades before wouldn't be forgotten. And in fact, the split of this department is a direct response to an RCAP suggestion. It's important uh, to note that despite all of this rapid evolution, the overhead for the Department of Indigenous Services Canada remains below average. In 23-24, it's only 0.6% as reflected in the main estimates. And the investments that we're making now are starting to show positive results. So for example, since 2015, the federal government has invested in 15,690 housing projects with 4,460 new homes being built, 9,359 renovations and upgrades uh, projects, and 1,871 lots serviced. This means, according to the 2021 census, 1,455 fewer on-reserve households are now considered overcrowded. In 2022-23, 100% of the funding envelope for First Nations on reserve housing was fully allocated. This means over 16, 662 million spent to build on reserve housing. Now, true reconciliation means understanding and supporting a shift to the principles and actions that support self-determination. Indeed, many governments before us imposed solutions on First Nations, which led to short-term fixes that didn't meet the long-term needs of communities. And when you think about it, reconciliation is equally about dismantling colonial structures that impose solutions and learning to support and work with goals that are set by communities that can better meet their needs and their vision. So since 2016, we've been advancing on a new fiscal relationship with First Nations. And this was, has resulted in 142 First Nations who have accessed a 10-year grant, which provides funding predictability, sufficiency, and flexibility. Since the coming into force of an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families, 200 Indigenous groups have received capacity funding to work towards exercising jurisdiction and developing their own child and family services, laws, and models. And so far, there are seven agreements across Canada, uh, over four provinces, and we expect a number of uh, more to be concluded soon. And I would say, having been at these ceremonies, this work is generational changing. This is about keeping children rooted in culture, family, and community, changing their reality, and increasing their chances at reaching their full potential. Long-term drinking water advisories, aging infrastructure, often beyond repair, and equal access, and funding for education, and no commitment to any concept of Jordan's principle, the essential pr program that provides services and products that support children's healthy development, was a feature of the previous government. We now have an additional $10.9 billion budgeted for 23-24. This is an annual increase of over 90%. Now, when communities have lived with austerity for over 150 years, the gap is huge, and it takes large investments, and it takes time to build up infrastructure, capacity, and much more. And since 2015, investments have been unprecedented, and they've been aimed at catching up with this chronic underfunding of core services. In fact, many Indigenous partners have noted this unprecedented investment and are excited about what the future holds. For 23-24, Indigenous Services Canada has allocated $39.6 billion in Mains, and that includes $19.6 billion for the department to partner with Indigenous peoples to deliver programs and services, along with the $20 billion for a settlement for family and child services that, as I might point out, has arisen as a result of the decades of systemic racism and underfunding. Decades of denial, neglect, and systemic racism will take generations to fully address and heal. So we, as a government, have sought to balance a focus of resources into both immediate measures and enduring change. The creation of Indigenous services as a standalone department right from the start has had a positive impact by focusing the attention of an entire department on service delivery and meeting the needs of communities. And this is, as my colleague pointed out, most evident in the broadening of the type of services that Indigenous Services Canada can provide during emergencies. As we're seeing just in the past several weeks, and there are many examples over the last number of years, First Nations communities are on the front line 
of the impacts of climate change. And now the department is able to plan for integrated health and social services as part of the emergency response. And during the emergence of COVID-19, ISC took a holistic approach to supporting communities facing this emergency with every area of the department involved. In addition to public health, supports were mobilized in regards to food security, transportation, mental health schools, income supports, and this could never have been done as quickly or as holistically with all service and funding areas being together under one roof. Where there was one minister in the previous <coughs> times charged with overseeing what was then known as Indigenous Northern Affairs Canada, the creation of the two departments means that First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples have three ministers who are now working with them to undo these decades of racist colonial policies. When the Conservative government left office, the annual spend to educate, house and provide health services to Indigenous peoples amongst other needs was $8 billion. And as I mentioned, this chronic underfunding left First Nations communities in desperate need. As I've spoken about here previously, the nine regional education agreements to set the foundation uh, for the future success are a critical example of how things are beginning to transform across nations. These education agreements now mean that First Nations have control over the education of their students and have the full authority and capacity to ensure that curriculum protects and promotes culture and language. And these are both evidenced ways to keep children resilient and healthy. The latest department results framework and indicators have been co-developed with the AFN and ITK. And this work means that now First Nations and Indigenous peoples are in control, not only of how things happen, but also what they believe needs to be measured. Outcomes must be important to the communities and they must have full control over determining how to assess how best to reach them and when progress is made. The work of self-determination means that federal, the federal government must learn new ways to let go of control and to work to return control to Indigenous peoples. Je remercie la commission pour... I thank the committee for its interest in such an important undertaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll proceed to our first round of questions, beginning with Mr. Vidal for six minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ministers, for your opening comments, and thank you to your officials for, for being here to answer questions today. We had a, a very frank conversation with Mr. Drew, the PBO, on, on Monday, and we talked about the uh, significant increases in spending, but over the, over the period of 15, 16 to 22, 23, but what we actually delved into more than that was the targets, the, the departmental results indicators and the, and the measurements of what we're trying to achieve in these departments. And to be honest with you, the frustrating part for me and what I heard from Mr. Giroux is that, I mean, th there was a substantial failure in the ability of the departments to meet the targets they set for themselves. And, and I emphasize the fact that it's the departments that set the targets. I know the uh, Ministry just talked about those being co-developed now, but, but these, these, these targets are set internally by the departments and there's many of them that change, there's many of them that are left to be determined for years. And having my own kind of personal experience with, a, with a, an organization that I served with that we use this kind of a management system, I understand the challenges that I do have some personal experience with it. So the frustration for me is the, the parliamentary budget officer's comment that says, you know, there's not a commensurate improvement in the ability of the organizations to achieve the goals that they set for themselves. In fact, that based on the qualitative review, the ability to achieve these targets has actually declined. And so, I, I, could dig, I, could, I could drill into a bunch more preamble, but I'm not going to. I, my, my question is really simple. After you read this report, and I'm going to ask each of you to, to not talk too long because I do have one more question I'd like to get to, but what was your response to the, re, the report in the sense of was there, was there anything done coming out of that to change any processes within the department that would improve that? You know, we're, we're shooting at a target to improve our ability of the departments to achieve those goals that they set some, for themselves. Was there any response to this report internally within each of your departments? Um, I'll start. Uh, maybe Minister Miller can speak, and then I'd like to turn to Associate Deputy Minister. 
Val Gideon, who's been working specifically in this area. I think the reflection of the parliamentary budget officer is a reflection of the fact that in this transformation of how we do business to support Indigenous communities, we are also really reflecting about who should be setting those targets and what they look like. And I'm sure you can appreciate that um, targets that are related to long-term outcomes are, uh, they do take time to start to demonstrate um, achievement. We are starting to see some modest, um, modest improvements, for example, in um, employment and income for people on First Nations. But in terms of setting the targets, the, the real work is working with communities to determine how and, um, uh, and what they would like to measure and how they are going to define for themselves success in uh, the targets that we set together. So that's the frustrating part, I think, when you're changing targets uh, midstream, if you will, although what is midstream in the context of 150 years, but midstream is that um, all of a sudden you're measuring new things. And so the other piece I would just say is that we're really reflective of the right to date or sovereignty. And Indigenous people have been studied ad nauseum to death, in fact, often with deleterious effects. Um, and so... Uh, you know, the, the concept of Indigenous uh, ownership, control uh, um, over their own data and their own, uh, their own research is a really important concept for the department. And so I'll stop there and maybe I can turn to Mark and... Yeah. You know, if, if you could, Minister, just keep... I, I do want to get to one more question, so if I, I'm, I don't want to cramp your I mean, style, I guess the answer is short, and I alluded please. it to quickly in my, in, in my, in my opening statement, Gary. The, for, for CERNA, there were between 70 and 78 percent of the indicators were met, uh, and some of them were, were, were very close. I'm not in, and neither, neither of us should be in a position to, to, to be making excuses. Uh, we, we, when we set targets and they are ambitious, we should be in a position to meet them. I think my immediate reaction was to look at the team at those indicators that uh, we are falling far short from and to try and adjust that, and if not, why? I, th I, don't, I think no one around this table would agree that we should be less ambitious in those indicators. This is about performance. Um, I, I think finally just we, there could have been some benefit with some back and forth with the PBO to qualify some of this so that you can have more flavor in asking the questions that you need to hear from us. Thank you. I, I want to quickly get on to one more question because at the end of our time the other day I really tried to get to a solution-based discussion with him and say okay how do we how do we actually come up with some ideas and one of the things we talked about and I won't get a long preamble because I don't have much time I don't think but um, one of the things we talked about is the is the executive compensation component and, and this this is not just your departments I think this is a government-wide thing so I'm, I'm looking at this from a bigger picture and if we understand how the the performance compensation works for at and above executive levels there was a very significant number of people in both your departments that got bonuses through this process or got their at-risk pay and I, I I get that concept but the at-risk pay and the bonuses are tied solely to personal performance goals they're not tied to corporate goals not tied to the organizational goals and I think that's a failing that we have and so when I asked the I asked Mr. Drew about that I said would there would there be a solution in or is there merit in considering a change to make sure that the organizational goals are factored into the because this is, there's this whole thing that what you incent gets accomplished, right? And the organization I came from, 85% of the performance compensation of our executives was based on the organizational goals and 15% was based on the personal goals. Here we have 100% based on personal goals if I understand the system, right? So uh, maybe just a quick comment to ask you if you would go back and advocate with that, you know, within cabinet at the cabinet table say maybe we have to look at this on a, on a broader perspective to make sure that we're incenting the right things, that we're actually accomplishing the right things by incenting the right things, and that might mean to make sure we tie the organizational goals to the performance system within the executive management system, if that makes any sense. I mean, in an independent public service, I, I think the ability of ministers to dictate who gets how much salary and what corresponding bonuses sh should be scrutinized heavily. Uh, MP Vidal it doesn't mean that we don't have a view on these things. Uh, frankly, if you were to ask me, and I, I do believe that bonus sorry, should be sorry, based Minister, on. I don't mean. I'm not asking you to determine the bonuses. I'm asking you to create a system that incents the proper things, like like government wide, to say, hey, you know what? We need to incent managers and departments across government, not just your departments, to actually consider the organizational goals that we're trying to achieve. Because the, the, the stats Vidal? that the Parliamentary Budget Officer Mr. gave Vidal, us you're say that we're not hitting those things. I'd like to hear from the witnesses. You're just out of time. That's a cabinet that we would like to have with the Clerk of the Privy Council. I, there are people around this table who, if I had discretion, I would have increased their bonus significantly because they saved lives during COVID. 
Well, now and, go to and I'll just say oh, that I think, you know, listen, uh, there is an important role for Treasury Board, uh, the clerk of the Privy <coughs> Council, to be uh, constantly reflecting about um, how a performance is measured. And, and I, think, I, I think that, uh, I think that uh, that is work that's ongoing. Now go to Mr. Batiste for six minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I think I'll just keep going with the discussion around COVID and the supports that we offered. And uh, I, I have to agree that when I talked to First Nations across the country, they said it was the first time that we saw an issue in this government. And when we looked at Indigenous communities, we didn't try to control where all the funding went, but we created a flexible approach and said, here's what you need, here's what we're going to give it to you. And I'm wondering, based on that success of, of getting through COVID by providing and working with Indigenous communities, did we learn any lessons about how maybe we can uh, more efficiently get money out the door to Indigenous communities during not only times of, of great need with, during COVID, but during normal kind of with, with the, the various other crises that communities are deal with. And if you could speak that, to that a little bit from both departments. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, uh, to, through the chair, the, the, I think that, uh, and I want to congratulate my colleague, Minister Miller, because in <coughs> fact, it was Minister Miller that led this approach with uh, the COVID response for uh, First Nations. And what we learned was that we needed to more rapidly move to a trust model for First Nations, that um, the method of distributing money, resources in emergency times um, was overly burdensome for First Nations experiencing crisis. And we've certainly taken the lessons of COVID-19 and applied them to the transformation of the emergency management program so that communities have the flexibility to be able to respond quickly in a very personalized way. Uh, when things are too prescriptive and, and application-based, uh, two things happen. One, uh, it really does set communities up to, to fail in some cases if it's an application that they may not have the ability or time to complete, especially in a crisis. But secondly, categories can be so prescriptive that it ties the hands of the community for creativity to be able to respond or the self-determination to be able to respond in a way that could be more effective than a government-determined approach. And so we have taken the lessons of COVID-19 to heart. Um, we are transforming a number of programs and as new programs come on board, using those lessons of self-determination, uh, autonomy in the design of how money gets to First Nations, Indigenous peoples. And I think uh, it's part of that reconciliation is to uh, have trust just like we would for provinces, territories. You know, massive amounts of money are transferred to provinces and territories every single year for health and social services and infrastructure. And uh, a lot of that money is transferred with very little uh, uh, requirement for outcome measurements, never mind, uh, never mind criteria about how that money needs to be spent. And so we are in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship uh, leaning into this new fiscal way of uh, ensuring that communities have that autonomy to respond. Minister Miller, did you want to chime in? No, I, I, I agree largely with what Minister Haidu said. The, the trust factor, I think if there's any lesson to be learned from an epidemic of this size uh, is that we need to move quickly, we need to be ambitious, and we need to be able to adjust on the fly. I, I share the committee's frustration about the shifting nature of some of these indicators. Um, obviously, sometimes percentages increase, you want to be hitting goals at a higher rate, but um, it, it does impede the ability to look backwards to see you know, where the issues are and then how to fix them in the future. Um, but this is, again, this is a model that is evolving, and it is one that, um, that we've learned a lot through the lens of of the COVID response and the ability of communities themselves to exercise a very basic right of self-determination. That requires financial capacity, but it also requires support from the federal government in a way that uh, has to be more nimble than, than, than the way it's, we have behaved in the past. Uh, so the, the inevitable question is, is the split of these two departments uh, valuable? And the answer, I think, resoundingly, is yes, uh, but there are challenges because as you disaggregate these two departments that have been intertwined for years, uh, you do feel challenges and you do see overlap and hopefully you don't see misspending. Uh, 
but it is um, it is an, it is important to have uh, these two departments separate and investing in uh, in indigenous communities in the way that, that we aspire as a nation that we do, which is on a basis of equals. Uh, and so those are some of the reflections that we've been having internally and glad to share with this committee. Uh, thank you for talking about uh, kind of the evolving model. Before I was uh, a member of Parliament, I, I spent a lot of time working for bands uh, across Nova Scotia. And one of the great things we did as a government was uh, previous to our government that if you didn't spend the dollars by March 31st, a lot of the time the federal government took those dollars back. And I remember the stress come March of getting funding in February and then trying to spend it by March 31st or having it go back to government. But uh, we've taken steps away from that to create that flexibility within our government and saying that if you don't spend them by March 31st, that we, our government was much more flexible in terms of saying, here is money that we can roll over. Is that something that we continue to do and look to flexibility on how we uh, fund Indigenous communities and making sure that we're not taking any money back as a government? Uh, it's... Uh, never a good scenario when we have to take money back because it means that people either didn't get services or the infrastructure didn't unfold as, as planned. And so absolutely, we take every step possible to help communities plan to use that money in the next fiscal year. Um, there are infrastructure projects that are complex that span over a number of years and we work to cash manage and to um, ensure that the community has access to those funds. We work on changing targets in terms, I mean, COVID has been, as you know, a huge shock to the system and infrastructure costs have been deeply affected and we work with communities to make sure that commitments we made pre-COVID uh, on infrastructure that wasn't completed or in some cases wasn't started and was delayed by COVID can be adjusted uh, as we go forward into the next uh, the next phase of building. Those are difficult conversations I can tell you because of course in some cases costs of building a particular uh, facility have gone up in the tens of millions of dollars, but we work with communities to make sure that we as a government can honor our commitment and that we can support them to manage the unexpected delays that have happened through COVID and other, in, other, in other ways. Okay, thank thank you. you, Mr. Batiste. Uh, Madame Gill, vous avez la parole. Madame Gill, you have the floor for six minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister Haidu and Mr. Miller for joining us. I have a question about the report itself by the PBO. Not in its content, but in the way it was done. I think, Ms. Minister Miller, I think you mentioned, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said that at the end of the day, the portrait painted by the PBO is perhaps a bit imprecise, which means that we, as elected officials, might have difficulties not only to re reading it but but finding information that isn't in the report and that and and it prevents you from answering our questions uh, fully and so so the report doesn't contain the, all of the valid information it needs to but in the current context, and I think Minister, Minister Haidu said something similar, because I heard, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I thought I heard you say something like, there are some criteria that are no longer valid for concerning the efficiency, so you need to tinker with the term efficiency. And, but on the whole, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you saying that the current formula means that we cannot either in your position read read the budget correctly. Thank you. And of course, Madam Chair, I would like both ministers to answer. Thank you. I don't want to pre present excuses for indicators that we're not met. But the fact remains that the analysis of the report, the office could have had more active feedback with our two departments to address some statements that have a tendency to, to mislead, particularly on page 12 when 
The report talks about current spending and forecasted spending, which do not take into account a, a, a unique factor in both departments after the, the supplementary estimates every time. They, the supplementary estimates are released, <clears throat> so it, it takes in, it, it draws conclusions without taking into account this important factor. And concerning the indicators and the report itself, they are indicators that are are qualitative. So it's important, uh, quantitative rather, and it's important to look at the quality of the indicators, the number of communities that have legislation in, in place to get out of the Indian Act uh, has been met, yes or no, and at what point were these indicators close to their objective, that is another factor that is not necessarily reflected in the report. And so in looking at the report, I said, well, obviously th there is work to be done. We need to look at the indicators in question to know where there was a clear failure that, and we need to course correct. But it is nevertheless a report that you you ordered, and I I have internally I'm able to ask these questions, but you could perhaps uh, look at this under the microscope to determine whether we are more or less meeting the indicators and ask questions that are more relevant. I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm just saying that in this type of report, there should be filtration in advance so that you can have a clearer picture of our two departments. Mr. Miller, I add the and perhaps, Mr. Miller, what would you propose? You already gave avenues, but it's a bit, we have a tool and, and we can't use the tool properly for, and it's, it's not against attack against any one person, but, but what would you propose for methodology? Because I, I know that it's complex given the different departments that we're talking about, uh, uh, CERNAC, and that could also ha ha happen elsewhere. Two things, you need to properly understand how the budget targets work in our departments, and you need to focus more on the quality of the indicators. So perhaps by choosing two or three, by choosing the ones that we were not able to meet, and then focus more on on the, det the, the, the details of, of why the indicators were not met. Madame Gill, could you please raise your microphone for, for the next question? Move on to Ms. Edlow for six minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to both ministers to bring your presentations to the committee. The departmental results indicators and the parliamentary budget officer's report on the departmental results indicators. Questions are important. It's not going on. I have a question. You don't hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. I think she has to... Um, I can't hear her now. Sorry about that. My interpreter... I was planning with my interpreter earlier regarding the, indic regarding the indicators, uh, writing down notes on the departmental results indicators. So we were planning earlier on some of the terminology. However, I understand now that these indicators or the forecasted uh, targeted budgets are um, constantly being uh, revised and these revisions of the indicators. Perhaps if I were to ask you this question, 
Will, will there be a year where these indicators will will be changed or revised do you do you have any expectations that these indicators that these indicators will be will remain the same or will we be given more solid results through the analysis of the indicators. I do want to hear uh, truthful indicators, but we've been uh, informed through this report that this report is uh, not complete. If, if this report was completely and fully uh, written, uh, I would want to ask um, uh, solid questions. Both ministers can answer me, please. Well, thank you very much, MP Idlut. And uh, yes, I think you know the, each uh, each area will have indicators that will end up being um, accepted and and supported by Indigenous partners that we agree on. And there's been quite a bit of work through an indicators framework that the department has been working on with partners to determine what those will be, and they'll be encapsulated in the departmental results framework. And maybe I can turn to Associate Deputy Minister. Uh, um, Gideon to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, last fall we, we just got approval actually from Treasury Board for a very exciting transformative approach for us in terms of our departmental results framework. It's enabled us to streamline significantly the complexity of our program inventory. So we're going from f like four core responsibilities to one core responsibilities. We're going from 11 service areas to eight and our program inventory is going to be collapsed from 33 to 18 programs, right? So that's going to enable us to have a much stronger focus on outcomes-based indicators that we are hoping the majority will be populated by First Nations, Inuit, and Métis-led research and data collection. And that builds on the success we've had with the First Nations Regional Health Survey. Uh, Eric and I were involved since it first started over 20 some years ago. We're dating ourselves. Uh, but with the National Inuit Health Survey and the funding that has been committed and our budget 2021 investments of 81.5 million to actually support First Nations Inuit and Métis in building those data strategies. That's what we intend to draw from in terms of the indicators and the data sources. I, I don't have a, a ton more to add. I do think by their nature, these do evolve, uh, these indicators, particularly with the work that we do to, to code develop them. Um, it does sometimes impede the ability to look backwards and to see the consistency of them, but um, they w it, would be, it would be helpful uh, sometimes when you look at the indicators to look at the quality of them themselves and to mm -hmm. scrutinize deeper into them. So you, you mentioned a more complete report, and, and not that I would invite more scrutiny, but certainly uh, a, a, a more complete picture of that would probably have you posing more difficult questions into some of the real challenges that we continue to face. Um, and obviously we need indicators to, 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 to properly reflect uh, where we are as a country and be quite honest about what they actually mean uh, at their basis. Because you could look at a couple of these indicators and say 80% of this is done, uh, but the remaining 20% is probably the hardest stuff to do and so there's some there's some scratching under the surface of these indicators that is well warranted um, obviously not the scope of this report but it's something that I think in a, for a matter of transparency and honesty that we foremost owe to indigenous peoples it's something that we have to be continue to be committed to how much yes of course these indicators or forecasted indicators, yes, they do change from time to time, but we all know that First Nations, as First Nations people, we're lobbying for the same reasons from the federal government. It's been many years that we've been informed, or the federal government has been informed that First Nations are struggling for 
within the cost of living uh, areas, uh, there's uh, not a lot of uh, services or resources rendered to the indigenous people. And these services and resources are not being rendered in a timely manner. And we all know that uh, uh, we all know that we have to lobby even more so. When you are going to produce a report, for instance, the departmental uh, results indicators or the parliamentary budget officer should report should produce a report that is not divisive. The report should be completely full um, because otherwise we'll, we won't be able to ask uh, uh, proper questions. It's not a real question, but rather a comment. Answering that, I mean, I think. You know, the entire system is rooted in colonialism. It's not just these departments. And so the decolonization of how we um, interact with Indigenous people, for example, to select indicators and to create a national outcomes based framework together is about changing the way that Indigenous lives are measured uh, from one that the government is in control of that. And the government is also the one that reports on that to uh, returning the control and self-determination to communities to measure for themselves how things are going, to understand better if the things they're doing, in addition to the inputs from the government, are actually resulting in outcomes that they see as enhancing community and, and community members. It's not an easy project because there is a... a a long-standing tradition in this place of, uh, and rightfully so, fiscal accountability attached to outcomes. But it hasn't, uh, in my mind, d been done in a way that, uh, including many of these offices, um, fully reflects the uh, autonomy of Indigenous peoples and the rights of Indigenous peoples to measure for themselves and control for themselves their own data and, uh, and determine for themselves what, in fact, they want to measure. Anecdotally, uh, when I was preparing for this, I understood that the education outcomes are shifting from educating on time to educating, uh, or educating, uh, is it educating on time to educating, uh, um, uh, or graduating, sorry, on time or graduating, you know, outside of the, the standard uh, time. That's not the way that we've talked about it. We've talked about graduation rates, period. Mm -hmm. And if I think about that from the conversations I've had as a minister, that makes sense to me because it isn't only about did you graduate or not. What communities are asking is uh, did it take longer for mm -hmm. a First Nations person to graduate, mm -hmm. an Indigenous person to graduate, which reflects the compassion of a community to understand that sometimes it does take longer if you've come from a background of inequity and that those uh, accomplishments should not be discounted. So I think there, I think there's some real promise in this because it is about um, data reconciliation as well. Thank you, Ms. Hidlow. We'll go to a condensed second round, beginning with Mr. Schmale for five minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ministers, for being here for this important conversation. Uh, Minister Hager, you just mentioned uh, the graduation graduation rates for Indigenous uh, children. Um, thank you for bringing that up and reminding me about that. Last time you were here in March, we were having a discussion about uh, setting a graduation rate, something in your departmental plan for the last two years you had set. It had been a target of the end of March to come up with that rate. Uh, has that rate been set yet? So, um, I will turn to Deputy Gideon. Um, yes, I mean, uh, my confusion at the time was not fully comprehending how the indicators were being worked through with First Nations and Indigenous peoples. And so now, as I just highlighted, uh, uh, those targets are underway. And uh, I'll turn to Val Gideon to talk a little bit about where we're at. Just very quickly, if we could, please. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so in terms of our um, the target for First Nations, so we are still uh, setting the year over year increase that we're anticipating and we will be we are doing that with partners. The minister is absolutely correct that we have changed the methodology in 2023-22-23 to measure from on time and extended uh, term rates in terms of the uh, graduation piece and that was new in terms of 2022-23. 
I want to go back to the uh, DRIs. Uh, that seems to be a, a topic of conversation today. And we're looking at um, the results that seem to be, according to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, going down here. Um, one of his quotes was, um, I think it's up to ministers to set the targets and to try to make their officials stick to them. Um, I know you spoke, both of you spoke a bit about that on how you're trying to keep departments on tasks. Um, what is there a guarantee that we have, and we've been here uh, doing this for quite some time, the targets seem to, to change every time a target isn't met. I, I don't think some of this would be tolerated in the private sector. What, what are we doing here to make sure that we aren't just pushing, uh, kicking the can down the road, we're actually getting results here? Well, I'll start, um, and I don't know if maybe I wasn't clear earlier, but I disagree that ministers are the ones to set targets. I disagree uh, that that is, uh, that, is, that is my role. My role is to support the department to ensure that targets are set, and there is a clear distinction in this. Um, in fact, it's a colonial practice that ministers would set targets and that would determine, you know, what outcomes needed to be achieved for what dollars. Um, the colonial practice is telling uh, First Nations what they must do with the money that they receive or the programs that they receive. But rather, uh, this approach is truly rooted in reconciliation and self-determination. So my role as a minister is to ensure that the department is doing the work of setting targets with First Nations and with Indigenous peoples and to have the resources they need to be able to do that work in a timely way, understanding that uh, sometimes it isn't the department that sets the timeline either, and that we work with First Nations and Indigenous peoples on their timeline, and we work in a flexible way with communities um, because they are often uh, shuffling many priorities or have their own consultations that are complex to complete. And so that's the constant balance as the Minister of Indigenous Services wanting to see, um, just like you, that there are targets so, arrived at. So but sorry, Minister, I only have five minutes. I'm also really wanting tight to make sure we do that in a respectful I appreciate way. that. So, okay, it, let's, I agree with you. Uh, we want to uh, top, take away the top-down approach. I agree with that. I think we're on the same page. Given that's the, the, the path that we seem to be all heading towards, and rightfully so, why did the department re jump in employees from 4,500 to 9,200? If you're trying to, to, according to the PBO report, if you're trying to put it bottom down instead of top down, uh, why are we continuing to uh, surge in, uh, in, in the department numbers? I don't think um, that's a fair at, uh, assessment of what's happening here uh, it, at all. Uh, in fact, what we're seeing is, in fact, severe shortages in certain areas of the department. So I will take First Nations Inuit Health Branch, for example, where we have significant incentives to recruit health care workers and huge gaps in the ability to recruit and retain, just like other, uh, other uh, jurisdictions, people who are health workers. Uh, certainly the department has a number of officials that work in a number of different areas, including frontline services. And I think that communities expect, for example, in emergency management, when they pick up a phone with a forest fire approaching, that we will have the capacity to be able to deploy people. But Val, maybe I can speak to you, uh, turn to you for a few more. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's important to also recognize that the way that the PBO assessed our HR um, levels was based on, you know, what's included in terms of our departmental plans, which happens at the beginning of the year. Uh, with supplementary estimates, we do at times get increased approvals for FTEs, and that also therefore skews the overall picture of growth, right? Because we, we can't staff people until we have approved FTEs, and that will come with additional investments that are approved over the course of the year. Um, we have seen a growth overall since we were established as a department in terms of human resources, but we've also seen an incredible amount of increase in funding, as the Minister has noted, um, of over 90% if you take the out-of-court settlements out. And that has also driven demand and requests for services. Jordan's principle is a perfect example of this. I mean, this is a legally ordered service delivery model that is reliant on public servants approving requests within a 12 to 48 hour window. 
so that requires additional staff. Otherwise, it's not possible to be able to meet our legal obligations under that order. Non-insured health benefits is another area where we also have seen growing demand for uh, health benefits, and it has been based on the fact that the government has approved expanded scope and increased access to services than what we had before. My final point is when you look at some of the targets around service delivery, for example, like non-insured, or when you look at the percentage that we've achieved in terms of meeting our service standards on secure certificates, we've actually exceeded them. And that is because we have been able to access the capacity to more effectively deliver those services. If I could quickly, Chair, if I could, with You're your very much out of time. I just want to correct myself. I believe I said okay. the PBO report. I meant to say the departmental plan, so I correct myself. Great. So noted. Thank you very much. We'll now move to Mr. Weiler for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank um, Minister Miller and, and Minister Haidu and officials for being here today to answer some questions on the PBO report. Uh, first, uh, to you, Mr. Miller, one of the criticisms in the PBO report is that the department's actual spending is always much higher than the planned spending because it doesn't take into account the, uh, the supplementary estimates. And uh, in your opening, you brought up the Gottfordson settlement, which of course was groundbreaking for being the first time ever to compensate bands for the impacts of culture and language from residential or, or day schools on top of the impacts to survivors and descendants. So wh wh why is it why is it this case that uh, that subs are not being considered? And is there something that could be done to address this going forward? Yeah, I think I'm it's a great it's a great question and i think just to just to take a step back and to look at the way the, this department and 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 minister Hyder's departments are funded through supplemental estimates uh, it it is a good chunk of that profile and so when you when you have a report like this that looks only about at the um at the plan spending which is based on the main estimates highly technical for most people uh, but very important in the case of a profile of this department that depends so much on supplemental estimates where there are billions of dollars that are going to historical settlements and changing people's lives for harm that's occurred uh, sometimes over decades and, and even centuries at times. Um, the Godfordson was one of the uh, particular examples that was secured through the supplementary estimates. And again, if we were to take the report to its logical extension, it would be qualified as a resistance to to, to change, which is which is um, bizarre. I, I'm pointing to again page 12. I mentioned it in French, page 12 of the of the report. Um, so what would have been beneficial would to have a proper uh, back and forth with our departments to um, get some color and give some color to to that, so that members could have a, a fully fleshed out report that would reflect the way these departments behave and the different articulation of the spending profiles that that underpin it. Um, I, uh, just a quick moment as well to, to respond to uh, MP Schmael's comment about some of these indicators. Uh, we sometimes have collapsed indicators that we have met, uh, for example, on the percentage of First Nations fiscal bylaws or laws that are met, and the percentage of fiscal of First Nations communities with financial administration laws. Those were two separate indicators. We met them, um, but we got rid of one of them because it was subsumed in the in in in, in one of the other indicators that that uh, was more general in nature. So there is sort of some house cleaning involved in some of these, mm. and, and it isn't self-serving to remove them. In fact, to separate them, would have, keep them separate would have been self-serving because you'd have two substantially similar indicators uh, indicating success. Um, I do sometimes have the opportunity to look at these indicators and say, why are we really doing these indicators? But I can't solely or should not solely change them. Um, but I, it doesn't mean we don't scrutinize them. So I want to pick up on one of the question or the response that you had there before saying that it would have been beneficial to have a back and forth with the PBO in this. So um, Minister Miller, both for you and, and Minister uh, Haiju, as, as far as you know, were, were you or anyone in your department approached to contribute either qualitative or quantitative data to support the PBO study? That's my knowledge. I just checked with my officials and no, we weren't. Uh, no, we uh, were not uh, contacted. We tried to see if we could seek some corrections and we were told it was too late and it was already being published. Okay, th thanks for that. Um, you know, there's been a lot of questions here about about the indicators. I was hoping you could provide some clarity to the committee here. Uh, just just to 
explain when and how often these indicators are reviewed and if that's on a set schedule. Uh, I will turn to Deputy Gideon for that. Well, I mean, we have an opportunity, sorry, we have an opportunity every year to be able to make adjustments to indicators, but I think um, like the approach that Indigenous Services Canada is doing with this new departmental results framework is we're in for the long haul. Um, you know, we want to, by turning things from administrative reporting imposed on recipients as a condition of funding to working with First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis Nation on the co-development of indicators and, and investing in their capacity to be able to do data collection that is in honorable to the ownership, control, access, and possession principles that First Nations uh, developed. Uh, we want to maintain that type of sustainable long-term commitment uh, to that partnership. Um, and so, you know, that is that being said, right, obviously open to feedback around some of these indicators and we could bring that to our partnership conversations. Um, you know, but it will all for sure want to align with, for example, the National Inuit Health Survey and the questions that it will, that first Inuit will design, right? We don't want to deviate uh, from those types of core uh, data sources. Thank you, Mr. Weiler. Um, Madam, Gim, Madam Gill, there's a Madam Gill, sorry for the first round. This time you have the floor for three minutes and 15 seconds. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, very quickly, what I heard in, in, in a condensed sense is that currently the way that we're doing, particularly for the issue of Crown Indigenous Relations and Services, is no longer working simply because I think, Madam, uh, Hi, do you said that you indicated that the targets to be reached jointly with communities, groups, indigenous nations, and today I'm hearing what was uh, started in 2021, and we're still talking about it today. We can no longer rely on the ways that existed before because things have changed. I don't know if, if I can go farther. I, I didn't analyze the the director, the PBO's because work because perhaps the portrait that we have is not a, a, a full image given all of the nuance that you want to be conveyed and that it can't be done here. So what you're doing as elected officials is, is, is not relevant. That's what I'm hearing. And, and respectfully, that's what I'm hearing. So I would like to hear whether you have an idea of how to do things differently or how the PBO could do things differently because he doesn't have the necessary tools to do his work. And the question is for everyone. Do you have an idea of changes? Because it would be um, unfortunate for Canadians and Quebecers for us to reproduce this uh, situation again. Thank you very much. I think the point of our um, presentation today and the officials are talking about uh, exactly that, uh, Madame Gill, the reform of how we set uh, measurements together with uh, First Nations Indigenous peoples. Um, and how we report back on that and who controls and owns the data and who does the research, this is the work of reconciliation. And I, far be it from me to, uh, you know, really understand the work that other offices are doing, but I will say that it is incumbent on every office and every office holder to think through the lens of self-determination if we truly want uh, to reform how we do things in this place. And that's hard work because it's about changing long-standing practice um, it is disappointing that the two departments weren't um, contacted, for example, because I think there would have been a rich opportunity to talk about the work uh, of joint uh, indicators uh, selection. And I think that that um, is uh, undoubtedly challenging work, but I think it has the longevity that we're looking for in terms of measuring what's important to First Nations, to Indigenous peoples. And that's to me, uh, that's to me the the uh, the exciting part of this work is that we will get to a results framework, and we're very close to being able to uh, release this uh, to, and it will be a document that will be refreshed. Uh, it will be a document that will be revisited, but it will be a document that's been co-created with Indigenous peoples. Merci, Madame Gill. Uh Thank you, Ms. Gill. Uh, 
Oh, <laughs> my man. Sorry about that. Thank you. Based on the fact that uh, collaboratively you are going to be implementing um, working with the indigenous people, as I look into the future, I'm envisioning a better structured uh, structure of indicators, and if these indicators were not accurate, the perhaps the indigenous people are going to be held accountable. Accountable. How can we be informed, or how can we be uh, well informed that you are going to be collaborating, and and how this collaboration will strengthen, and how are we going to be empowered? How are the indigenous indigenous people going to be empowered? The indigenous people need to be empowered. And the need for empowerment, how uh, we always think of ways to improve and empower our people. Can we have a solid indicator that working together, that you're going to base your foundations on collaboration with the First Nations Indigenous Peoples for Empowerment. Thank you. That's a pretty profound question, and I think it touches on a lot of, uh, it touches on the philosophy behind reconciliation. And it's a hard, it's a hard question because, um, you know, there's this, uh, there's this book that I read a long time ago called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Maybe you've read it by Paulo oh, Freire. Sure. <laughs> and I read it in university first, and I don't think I fully understood it. And I reread it again when I was appointed to this position. And it talks about oppressed people and uh, how it, it is indeed um, never going to be the colonizer that has the answers to uh, decolonize. It is really the indigenous peoples themselves. And this is what you're touching on. And what we're trying to, as the colonial partner in the relationship, reflect on how we get out of the way so that indigenous people have the power and the self-determination and the tools that were promised in many different ways to rebuild community and to rebuild governance and to rebuild um, in this case, measurement of how communities are doing and whether or not the things that uh, the federal government would like to measure are the same things that indigenous people want to measure. And lo and behold, we find they are not sometimes the same or they are not measured in the same way or they're not even conceptualized in the same way. You know, when I talked about education, that was such an aha moment for me because in Western culture, it's you either graduated or you didn't. There isn't an in-between. And when I reflected on the change in the indicator, it's a different philosophy of education, which is that it's ongoing. And sure, we can talk about how long it took someone to graduate, but we can't discount that someone will graduate in the future. Doesn't that make sense? From an indigenous perspective, um, it, to me, made sense when I heard the measurement that was selected in partnership. Uh, so I think we have a lot to learn as a country, uh, as, as the colonial partner in the relationship that I think will benefit um, all Canadians, actually. So thank you for that pretty profound question. Thank you, Ms. Idlo. I'd like to thank our, our ministers for joining us this afternoon and for your teams. Um, there is an agreement in the room that we will adjourn our meeting. Unless the ministers want to stay long. Unless the ministers want to stay and keep, yeah. <laughs> we're, I'm happy to go another round. Sure. I'm, the meeting will be adjourned. Lots of things I didn't get to. <laughs>